program to bring you this special report. Live from the Heinz Veterans Memorial Convention Center in Boston, New Center 5 presents The Ordination of a Bishop, the Consecration of the Right Reverend Barbara Harris. Good morning, I'm Mary Richardson reporting live with former Channel 5 Religion Editor Hubert Jessup on this most historic day in the history of the Episcopal Church, and in fact, Hubert, in the history of Christianity. That's really right, Mary. This is a big occasion. 8,000 people gathered here today, over 60 bishops that will be participating in this consecration. And the reason? For the first time in over 2,000 years of Christian history, a female bishop will be consecrated today in the church. That is the reason why this is such a historical event. When Jesus called the first apostles together over 2,000 years ago, there has been a constant tradition since that time of Episcopal leadership. They've all been male. Today, that tradition is going to be changed. A female bishop will be consecrated. For many people, this is a cause of concern. They are not in support of this. But for these 8,000 people here today and for the Diocese of Massachusetts, it's a cause of joy and celebration. We are also fortunate to have with us today the Reverend Tim Dobbins of St. John's Episcopal Church in Gloucester. And Tim, you were instrumental in helping to define the role that the new bishop will play in the life of this diocese. This must be a very exciting day for you. It's an exciting day for me and for a number of others, the 100,000 Episcopalians in this diocese and really the nearly 3 million in this country. It's also important to say there are about 70 million Anglicans around the world who share in this experience, either in a joyful way or perhaps a painful way. I also want to thank Channel 5 and the two of you for televising this historic event. It's a wonderful day where the world can see, really, the church exists to give itself away. God is the audience today. We're the congregation, and it's a magnificent moment to give thanks to God for using all God's people to accomplish His purposes. Well, thank you, Tim, for being with us. And you really do have the feeling that history is being made here today. The procession has already started. We are told that the procession into the Hinds is going to take about a half an hour, a half an hour just to get all of the bishops, priests, dignitaries like Governor Dukakis into the Hinds, and of course the bishop-elect herself, Barbara Harris, who will be coming in at the end of that procession. Inside the Hinds, more than 8,000 people watching and waiting for the moment of consecration of their bishop. We begin with New Center 5 Special Correspondent Clark Booth's special profile. Clark had an opportunity to spend some time with Barbara Harris, and he tells us now who she is, what she brings to the life of the church, and why her appointment has generated such excitement and controversy. The Reverend Barbara Harris has been defying the odds all her life. Long before she was allowed to become a priest, she proved her mettle in the business. She has always been on the cutting edge of progress. She has never accepted yesterday's truths as today's facts. Long before she gravitated to the church, she was an activist searching for racial justice in such places as Selma. She was a pioneer in the cause of securing the Episcopal priesthood for women, a participant in the first so-called illegal ordination, and all of that wasn't easy in a church devoted to form and deeply gripped by tradition. Since her ordination in 1980, she has chosen to emphasize a social justice ministry, the support of civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, the poor, the aggrieved, the unchurched. Our focus on, on peace and justice issues needs to be heightened. All of which seems to have made her a very logical candidate for this historical role, which had one requirement above all. The candidate had to be strong-willed, not easily deterred or rebuffed, tough. You could hardly call me passive. <laughs> I, uh, I do feel very strongly about uh, some of these issues, and I feel very strongly about the church. I love the church and uh, I, I feel that the church can be much more than she is and if I did not love the church I would not be active. Sternness of will was a priority because the first woman to rise into the church's hierarchy was bound to stir controversy and in the case of Reverend Harris there has been a lot of it. We consider that Jesus' decision 
to restrict that ministry to men was a free decision, free, in other words, free of sin and sexism and constraint of any kind or social convention. And it was a sovereign decision insofar as he's the Lord of the church. That is a minority position in this diocese where Bishop Harris was, after all, freely elected in a decidedly democratic process. That election was ratified by a majority of the 118 American Episcopal bishops, although the vote may have been close. The global church is another matter. Only five of the 27 Anglican provinces in the world recognize women priests, or will therefore recognize bishop-elect Harris. God bless you all. God save the king. Among the dissenters, the all-powerful Church of England, symbolically at the least, the most dramatic presence in this church. If Bishop-elect Harris were to go to England, she would be restricted to the duties of deacon. In Boston, it would be her good fortune to work under a man who is totally sympathetic to her cause, Bishop David Johnson. But enlivened and filled with your word and the body of your son, we may be more faithful expressions of justice and peace and love in your world. Bishop Johnson has agonized over all of the opposition, what he has called the often mean-spirited anger it has stirred, and he has found it all baffling. Uh, it bothers me, because uh, I don't think, uh, I just don't find that valid. I mean, the anger and the, and the hurt that people display uh, in this regard would be better, better well-placed in some other areas. It's like uh, uh, one of the present magazines has a full spread on the various types of guns you can buy in the United States uh, and how much they cost and where to buy them. And people are using them on schoolyards and things like that. And I somehow think some of our values got a little out of whack on all of this. You would like to see some of that anger, anger visited on that particular That's subject. right, where evil is present. I don't think evil is present with Barbara Harris or her election. Her critics, above all, object because she is a woman. But they complain as well of the fact that she's divorced, too liberal, and in their opinion, not adequately trained. But Reverend Harris believes there could be an element of racism in this volatile mix as well. I am convinced that there is an element of racism and sexism and classism as well. Um, these are, are things that are so pervasive in our society. I will be working to hopefully heal some of the hurt that has occurred. But I must point out that reconciliation is a two-way process, and I certainly cannot do it alone. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, oh, bless you. Oh. While the fact she's a woman has caused most of the controversy, racial justice is equally her concern. Black Americans have never been a major force in the Episcopal Church. The Eastern Massachusetts Diocese is 95% white, and she will be only its second black bishop ever. She wants this church to do more for and be more with black Americans. Peace, God. Thank you. And that, along with a plea to put aside the current dispute, was basically the message she brought to the predominantly black St. Bartholomew's Church in Cambridge last week. Many of our churches must recognize that solemn masses and other high church rituals, sometimes interspersed with a little gospel music for soul, are fine. But liturgy alone will not bring in the kingdom. And our incense offerings are an abomination to the Lord when people outside our doors are denied. And a thousand genuflections cannot atone for injustice unchallenged. 
We cannot afford the sinful luxury of private feuds and public fusses. There is much work to be done and too few willing to do it. And while we nitpick over inconsequential items, the real issues go unaddressed and unattended. Our energies must be applied to serving God's people, not engaging in power plays and seeing who is going to run the show, my gang or yours. Thank you, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. It is a complex and compelling woman who today takes her place in history. This is Clark Booth reporting. We are listening to the Chinese choir from St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral as the bishops, the priests, the various dignitaries from all around the country and in fact some from different parts of the world process into the Hinds. Let me ask you, uh, Hubert, Tim, what can you tell us about why this consecration has attracted the tremendous amount of attention it has? In fact, uh, Bishop uh, Harris, Bishop Elect Harris is uh, on the cover of Newsweek this week. Well, that's right, Mary. The point basically is that she is the first female bishop in the history of Christendom. That is about as simple as you can say it. It's never happened for 2,000 years, and as a result, this is a very important historical event. There are people, of course, who disagree with that, think that uh, women should never be consecrated as a bishop. There are others, and they make the majority at this point in the Episcopal Church, who believe that it's time for women to take this office. And they are here in force to show their support for that idea and to celebrate the, uh, the expansion of the priesthood and of the Episcopate to include a woman. One of the other reasons that people are expressing not only joy but some concern is that Bishop-elect Harris has spent much of her life ministering to the marginalized people of society, the poor, minorities, women who have not had a full voice in the life of the church and other parts of society, as well as those in prison. And because of that, she perhaps represents to a number of people um, uh, leftist views, if you will, or at least politically, she tends to side very often with the oppressor. Uh, she understands that to be the biblical mandate, obviously, and some of us have... Uh, other thoughts that go with that, and others express their concerns. So there's not just the theological consideration that concerns people, but the political one. But I want to make the point that this is true for every bishop elected in the church who have been all males for the last 2,000 years. Everyone's been concerned about that person's politics. And as Hubert said, it really is the gender question. And many rejoice and others express uh, some concern and, and, and call for caution. We see uh, in the procession women priests um, Tim, you said earlier you wondered how many women priests, probably the question is in the United States, how many women priests are not here today? This, <laughs> right. this has That's to be an especially big day Well, for certainly them. as you watch this procession, you will see many female priests here because this is their moment. Uh, when the Episcopal Church made the decision to allow a, a priest, women priest, it of course also allowed women to be ordained as bishop at that point. However, it has taken 12 or 14 years to come to a point where a woman has become a bishop. So all of those other women who have been ordained over the past decade are all going to want to show up to this event to say, yes, we support, we affirm her uh, consecration, and we're here to show that solidarity. What are the questions that arise out of her ordination today? Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury has raised some questions. Um, the church, of course, is in communion with uh, the Anglican Church in England, but there are some differences there. There are, Mary. One of the strengths of the Anglican communion is that we are connected and in communion throughout the world, as I mentioned earlier, with 70 million Anglicans, by the way, most of whom are black or people of color. Although we are connected in communion, we are autonomous in the way we govern ourselves. And as I uh, was, as I discovered the other day, two-thirds of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Episcopalians. And they made sure that our church was a democratic institution, whereby the election is legal in every respect. Many communions throughout the world have not grown, perhaps, in the way we have or changed in the way we have as a pluralistic society. They don't understand the tensions that come in a pluralistic society such as ours. So many people are in some place of concern uh, as regards the election and a subsequent today imminent uh, consecration of the first woman bishop. We've got to see in the context of the diocese and our needs in her role as an assistant or what is called a suffragan bishop. At the same time, a bishop is ordained for the whole church. And until the time comes where she is allowed to 
serve and to witness in provinces that don't allow it, she must be bound by the rules of the autonomous provinces of the Anglican Communion. And an interesting question you raise is what will happen, for example, to the priests in the Episcopal Church that she ordains? Will they be allowed to practice their faith in England? These are the kinds of questions that That's will come right. out of this ceremony. Well, as it now stands, they would not in England. Uh, however, they would in the United States. Um, and that is one of the tensions that, uh, uh, that exists. But I think it's important to put that tension within context. There have been, historically, many reasons for divisions among people in the Anglican Communion, not just the issue of whether women are going to be priests or bishops. And certainly there are reasons for tensions ecumenically with other uh, 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 traditions over interpretation of key issues, sacraments, uh, authority, biblical interpretation. So there are many reasons why uh, Christianity has historically had disagreements. The fact that there are disagreements doesn't mean that decisions shouldn't be made and uh, and carry it out. There's never uh, been a time in the history of the church where there's been a serious crisis or a time of tension that has not produced great growth in many respects. And one hopes that this event is such a time. This is in, uh, this particular service is in marked contrast to four years ago, we remember the consecration of uh, uh, Bishop uh, David, John David Johnson, Johnson, Johnson was actually held in the Roman Catholic Cathedral with Cardinal Law in attendance, marching in the procession, and in fact speaking at the service. Uh, Cardinal Law is noticeably absent today, and people might wonder why. Well, the Cardinal Law, as I understand it, is returning from a visit to Rome, and therefore was unable to attend. Um, however, it does cause some concern on the, the, it, to deal with the question of the, the, from a Catholic point of view, to deal with the question of the consecration of a female bishop. The Catholic tradition does not recognize a female priest. Therefore, it also would not recognize a female bishop. In keeping with that tradition, it would only make sense that Cardinal Law would not attend the service. That is the, the tradition of the church, and out of respect and honor of that tradition, it would make sense for him uh, not to come, because to a certain extent, this, uh, this consecration goes against the tradition of his own, uh, of, of his own church. Um, however, the Cardinal has sent a, a letter to uh, Bishop Harris and to uh, the Episcopal Church as a whole, welcoming her as a part of the religious leadership in New England and Boston. And so I think that there will be some growth on that issue on both sides, on the Episcopal side and on the Catholic side. We should mention today there might be a moment or there will be a moment of high drama. No one is exactly sure what will happen at the point in the consecration when there is a moment where dissent is allowed, where someone or persons in the congregation can actually stand up and object to what is happening. That's right, Mary. From the early church, really the third century, we have provided a place in the consecration of a bishop for people to question the legality of the event. It's just like a wedding. If you've gone to a wedding and a priest or a rabbi or a person, or a clergyman asks for some dissent, people have a chance to say something, although we don't give them much time to do it. However, today, with something so significant historically as this event, we do need to see that this place of protest is a part of the service. It is not a part from, it's a part of and anyone who would have a problem on any question is allowed to say something about it. The uh, third group in the procession is now entering the hinds, being led by the torchbearers. At this point in the procession, Mary, what we are about to see actually is the group that will actually participate in the consecration itself. Uh, they are led by the Episcopal flag that we saw a bit earlier. Uh, they are followed by various ecumenical representatives uh, from other denominations uh, around Massachusetts and New England and the country as a whole. Uh, this consecration is so important that there are people who have flown in from other states to be here to participate in that. In addition to that, we, we have civic leaders, including the governor. There is Governor Dukakis uh, in the middle of our shot there. And uh, we understand Mayor Flynn. Yes, there's Mayor Flynn right next to him. There's the governor. You can see him much better in that particular shot. And uh, it is appropriate that civic leaders attend such a major event because this is a new religious leader in Boston and New England. I think it's particularly important also that she will take a major role in the black community. Uh, she is black. The Afro-American community will welcome her with open arms. And from a political point of view, I suspect that she's going to be involved in many issues over the next few years as a result of her position. She is quite candid. In fact, some of her critics would call it blunt about some of her criticisms. Uh, she 
she spoke of racism uh, in, in terms of her appointment and said that she thought that given the fact that our, we do live in a society tainted by racism, that that in some respects she felt played a role in the criticisms of her appointment. I was going to ask you, Hubert, do you expect her to play a very active role in racial issues in Boston and in perhaps changing the climate of the city? Well, to say to change the climate of the city perhaps is a big order because many people have tried and of course there has been progress on racial relations and hopefully that will be improved over time. However, I think that the point here is that her beginning work in the diocese will most likely be on the side of pastoral care. Typically the role of the suffragan bishop, which she is, will be performing, is to help people in local parishes deal with typical parish issues parish growth, parish development, questions of uh, calling of uh, rectors to parishes. Those types of issues are the agenda which most uh, suffragan bishops attend to. In this situation, because of her background with involvement with social issues, I suspect that she will also take an active role in that. That is not unusual in the diocese, by the way. The uh, 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 often does Bishop this. Johnson has been quite active in social issues. Bishop Coburn before that, and before that was Bishop Burgess, who was the first black Episcopal bishop in the United States, and he took a leading role in race relations, not only here in New England, but also throughout the country. So she's following in a tradition in that sense. I think as you look at the congregation gathered today, the applause starts. And that's because the be. people have seen her for yeah. the first time. She is coming in and the people have recognized her and are giving her a round of applause. This is a bit unusual to hear a spontaneous round of applause for a, a bishop-elect. I've never seen this in a consecration before. Have you, uh, Tim? No, I haven't, Hubert. It uh, obviously reflects the feeling among many people, many of people here who did not vote for her in convention but support the consecration as we see it today. And as she processes in her mother, from Philadelphia is here to watch this moment as our her brother and her sister. Mary, her mother is a church organist at 86 years of age in a church where Barbara oh, served is. and is still playing at this time. That's right. And there she is. She's walking in, and at this particular point, she is dressed quite humbly. You can see, you can see that she's dressed only in a uh, in white. Later, other uh, aspects of vestments would be added to her dress as she takes on the office. She acknowledges the crowd, very joyous music, tambourine. Good gospel hymn to bring her in. All of these people are part of local congregations which shows the strength of the church scattered in the world, all over the world. leading this is from uh, the uh, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Cambridge, St. Paul's. And that is not only an ecumenical relationship between the Episcopal Church and the AME Church, but also is a solid sign of solidarity between the Afro-American tradition and its style of worship. Uh, as you can see and hear, people are clapping their hands and having a good time. They this are. is a real nice song. I don't think 60 bishops have ever been welcomed to such an enthusiastic <laughs> event. That's true. <laughs> and the presiding bishop of the church, the most Reverend Edmund Browning has just come in. He's wearing the red mitre. And he, he, in fact, will be the one who will lead the consecration service. And it's because, from a legal point of view, of his participation that this, in fact, will be a consecration. The the Meanwhile, the party is just getting started, Tim. I know they are. <laughs> bishop David Johnson, who is the diocesan bishop, has just placed the staff on the altar. Two bishops from Pennsylvania, Bishop Ogilvy and Bishop Bartlett. And John Walker, who is the Bishop of Washington, D.C., who will be her mentor in the House of Bishops. John Walker is on the far right of the yes. altar. And that's Bishop Johnson, who just put his glasses on and is uh, watching. Vic um, Chang is the chaplain to the presiding bishop, and he is standing beside the altar. And the presiding bishop is now leading the applause and clapping with the music. And the presiding bishop, in fact, will be the one who will lead the uh, liturgy throughout the uh, consecration and will give the first words of, uh, of the liturgy as soon as the song comes. One uh, wonders at a moment like this what must be going through her mind. And Tim, you actually had a chance to talk to her about how she, how she would feel she's, during this moment. Yes, we did, Mayor. We spent a little time a few uh, days ago in the morning 
and maybe I can share some of those thoughts as this service continues. Applause after an entry hymn. I've never heard it before. And we haven't even gotten to the processional hymn yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is an enthusiastic room. Just amazing. Mary, the hymn we're about to hear was uh, chosen by Bishop-elect Harris and was also the hymn sung at the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana in St. Paul's Cathedral in London.
now the service begins with Bishop Edmund Browning presiding, head of the Episcopal Church in the United States. Holy Spirit, and bless be your heart's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, Mary, we are now underway. The uh, liturgy has actually begun, and as people are seated, we prepare for the first part of the liturgy, which is called the presentation. During this time, certain legalities that are required are achieved. In this, we will hear that there is evidence of her proper election as a bishop, evidence of the acceptance of that election by bishops and standing committees around the country, and evidence of her ordination. Trusting in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, have chosen Barbara Clementine Harris to be a bishop and chief pastor. 
We therefore ask you to lay your hands upon her and in the power of the Holy Spirit to consecrate her in the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I would ask now that the testimonials of the election be read. Okay, at this time, and Hubert, there are a number of people coming to the podium to make the case for the legality of this election. The Reverend uh, Gerald Porter is standing beside Bishop Elect Harris, and he's the provost of the cathedral. This is to certify that at a special convention of the church in the Diocese of Massachusetts, duly called in accordance with the constitutions and canons of said diocese, and assembled in the Cathedral Church of St. Paul, Boston, Massachusetts, on the 24th of September, 1988, the Reverend Barbara Clementine Harris, interim in charge of the Church of the Advocate, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and executive director of the Episcopal Publishing Company, being over 30 years of age, was duly elected suffragan bishop by a constitutional majority consistent with the constitutions and canons of the Diocese of Massachusetts and that all the requirements of the constitutions and canons of the Episcopal Church have been complied with. In addition, as prescribed by Title III, Canon 21, Section 1A, evidence of her ordination as a deacon and priest and the certificates as to her mental and physical examination and the testimonial of election signed by a constitutional majority of the convention have been received and are on file in our diocesan office. This is, as you can tell, witness, very legalistic. Are, These are David canonical Jesus requirements, and although it may sound legalistic to us, especially in the consecration of this particular bishop, it's important. Why, Tim? It's very important, Mary, because Barbara, Bishop-elect Harris, represents an entire church, as we mentioned earlier, the entire Anglican communion. And it's very important that all the rules, regulations, and canons have been abided by throughout this process, not only in the diocese, but in the national church at large, where several consents are necessary, and we'll talk about that. Testimonial now. of election of a suffragan bishop. We, whose names are here underwritten, fully sensible of how important it is that the sacred order and office of a bishop should not be unworthily conferred and firmly persuaded that it is our duty to bear testimony on this solemn occasion without partiality or affection, do in the presence of Almighty God testify that we know of no impediment on account of which the Reverend Barbara Clementine Harris ought not to be ordained and consecrated to that holy office. We do, moreover, jointly and severally declare that we believe the Reverend Barbara Clementine Harris to be of such sufficiency in good learning, of such soundness in the faith, and of such virtuous and pure manners and godly conversation as to be able to exercise the office of a bishop to the honor of God and the edifying of his church, and to be a wholesome example to the flock of Christ. Subscribed by David E. Johnson, President of the Convention, and Leon A. Brathwaite II, Secretary of the Convention, and dated the 24th of September, 1988. This is a high drama we are witnessing here, although some might not be aware of it, but every technicality, every legality must be observed because there may be those who would look for an objection to say this is not canonically correct. That's right, Mary. In addition, these words are the words that many women have been waiting to hear for years in the Episcopal Church. This makes it legal. This means that the church has accepted uh, the consecration of a bishop as a, uh, as a woman as a bishop. And so, while it's kind of boring to listen to, and if you're perhaps on the outside, you're saying, how come a church is so legalistic, and why is all of this? It sounds a bit like a political convention or something. In fact, these words carry great power. It means that the church now legally accepts women as a bishop for the first time in the history of over 2,000 years of tradition. So it's a big, big moment. Signed, Gordon J. Sperling, reporter. Listening to the uh, Reverend Ed Miller, who is the chairman of the Commission on Ministry, which oversees those going into the ministry. And we heard George Kidder just before him, the chancellor of the diocese. And that was the evidence of ordination, That's meaning right. that she was ordained as, an, uh, as a, uh, uh, a priest in the church and now is ready to be ordained as a bishop. This is Tom Crom. This is a very important consent. In accordance with Title III, 
Canon 21, Section 1, I'm writing to notify you that in the matter of consents for the ordination and consecration of the Reverend Barbara Clementine Harris as Suffragan Bishop of the Diocese, we have received as of the 2nd of February, 1989, 61 consents from standing committees of the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, signed the Right Reverend David E. Johnson, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts. A majority of standing committees in the Episcopal Church must approve of the election in any diocese in the country. And well, they we, were waiting but we will never know the exact vote. We don't for any bishop. It's a majority. It, it's never published. Uh, the assumption is that if the majority is there, it's by acclamation. The ordination and consecration of the suffragan bishop of Massachusetts. Be it known by all the people of God that 66 bishops, being a majority of the bishops having jurisdiction in this church, have consented to the ordination and consecration of Barbara Clementine Harris, as a bishop in the Church of God and to her status in the House of Bishops as Suffragan Bishop of Massachusetts, being the 834th bishop in the American succession. Herbert A. Donovan, Jr., Bishop of Arkansas and Secretary of the House of Bishops. Now, Mary, all of the canonical requirements have been met and evidence has been presented to that. And now, Barbara Harris will be asked if she is prepared to be a bishop. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I, Barbara Clementine Harris, chosen bishop of the church in Massachusetts, solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. And I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the Episcopal Church. At this time, they are going to have the bishop-elect sign the testimonial which she has just read. It's important from the time of the Reformation that this church, the Anglican Church, has held the centrality of Scripture in all its endeavor. And she is now making a public statement that she will uphold not only the doctrines and disciplines of the church, but also be bound by the rubrics of Scripture as they were given to us by the apostles and the gospel writers, and uh, as well as the Old and New Testament. Mary, while she is signing, the audience perhaps is anticipating the next stage in this legal process, which is an offer by the bishop for anyone who dissents from this election to have an opportunity within the context of the service itself to make their dissent known. This is that moment that we spoke of before where, like, uh, similar to a wedding, where you're asked, is there anyone in the congregation who knows any reason why this shouldn't proceed? That moment will come. And in prior services, it is not unusual to have someone actually mm -hmm. stand up and object. It has happened, Mary. There, uh, Twice at the consecration of the Bishop of the Armed Forces, people have risen to the occasion in the context of the service to question the validity of having a bishop of the Episcopal Church serve the armed forces. It's happened in other cases with politically sensitive issues. So it could happen today and perhaps it won't, but it is a part of the service and it allows people to question the integrity of the process. So anything that follows will in fact be not only legal, but approved by the entire church in this United States. The other bishops are at this point acting as witnesses, merely signing on. That's to right, her saying signature. that they have heard her say what she said and that she in fact did sign it. This offer of an opportunity to dissent is a, in keeping with the democratic tradition of the Episcopal Church. The notion is that even if there's only one person opposed, they still ought to have an opportunity in this service to have their voice heard. Clearly, this is a canonical election. All of the legal requirements for election have been met. The testimony that we just heard testifies to that. But there still may be someone who says, I don't agree, and I, the church wants to give them that opportunity. That's exactly right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have heard testimony given that Barbara Clementine Harris has been duly and lawfully elected to be a bishop of the Church of God 
to serve in the Diocese of Massachusetts. You have been assured of her suitability and that the church has approved her for this sacred responsibility. Nevertheless, if any of you know any reason why we should not proceed, let it now be made known. Someone is coming forward at this time to Hi, raise questions. They just would we, the congregation please be seated. <clears throat> please state your name. I, John Jameson, am making this protest in the name of the Prayer Book Society of the Episcopal Church. Barbara Harris cannot be made a bishop for the same reason that she is not and cannot be made a priest. Because the tradition of the Universal Church does not authorize the ordination of a woman to the presbyterate or episcopate. I ask the congregation to please give the courtesy to the microphone. No ecumenical council has vindicated any change in the interpretation of this tradition. Bishops of the Anglican Communion, as well as of this very church, have already declared that they will recognize neither her orders nor any orders proceeding from her. All consecrations, ordinations, confirmations, communions, and absolutions administered by her will be null and void. Furthermore, this action is illegal because the church's constitution has not been amended to allow it. This action, this action, Bishop, treats the laws of the church as well as the mystery of the sacrament with contempt. Bishop Browning, please weigh the consequences. By proceeding with this pretended consecration, you will perpetuate a sacrilegious imposture. You will abandon the communion of all those churches descended from the Church of England, and you will destroy the concept of legality in the Episcopal Church. Finally, if you proceed despite these objections, I declare in behalf of the majority of Episcopalians that this is not an action of the whole church. There's one other. There's another objection now coming to the microphone. And I would ask Everyone, please uh, be quiet till we finish these objections. Please, right, Reverend Father in God, presiding Bishop Browning and your fellow bishops. I, James Hopkinson Cupid, Jr., presbyter in good standing, canonically resident in the Diocese of New York, stand before you today in the spirit of charity to implore you not to proceed with the ordination to the Episcopate of this candidate. I believe that her election and consecration to the office of Bishop in the Church of God is contrary to sound doctrine grounded in Scripture and to the tradition of the one holy apostolic Church of Christ of which this province of the Anglican Communion is a part. The election of a woman to the Episcopate of our church has already caused grievous division in the Anglican Communion, and her intended consecration will be an intractable impediment to the realization of that visible unity of the church for which Christ prayed to the Father and for which the church has prayed throughout the ages. Therefore, I beseech you, sirs, to reconsider this action, which is the reason for your assembling here today, recognizing its divisive, sectarian nature as contrary to the unbroken tradition of 2,000 years of ap apostolic order. Thank you. Thank you. The Book of Common Prayer contemplates that reasons why the ordination of the bishop-elect should not proceed may be stated at this point in the service of the ordination. The reasons which have been advanced uh, have been raised in previous months 
and they've been broadly uh, ventilated since the election of Barbara Harris on September the 24th, 1988. Nonetheless, in conformity with the Constitution of this church and the canons of the General Convention, a majority of the standing committees of all the dioceses of the church have consented to the consecration of the bishop-elect and thereafter bishops constituting a majority of all the bishops of the church having jurisdiction have likewise consented. In this circumstance, we shall proceed with the service of ordination as printed on your service <laughs> number. Bishop Browning has just said all the legalities, all the legalities have been met in every respect and the Constitution has been upheld. As I said earlier, there are people here who don't support Barbara as a bishop as people don't support certain men, but they support the system that allowed her to be elected and now consecrated. So Mr. Jameson's comment that he spoke for the majority of Episcopalians that uh, were looking... Well, I think you, you, you see, you do not see the lunatic fringe of the church gathered here today. There are 8,000 people representing the church worldwide. He represents a large number of people. And I hope that they continue to increase the dialogue with the same people you see here today who are in support of this act. And that has been the Anglican way throughout our history, and I pray and hope that it will continue to happen. Here, the bishop-elect is being greeted by members of her family and supported warmly. You see her wearing an alb and an amice around her neck. She didn't damage her neck. That's an ecclesiastical garb, which is called an amice. Nevertheless, she seems to have been uh, troubled well, by what just happened. Would this, you please turn death. in your program to page four? And now we proceed. Quite a show, a standing ovation. I've Isn't never seen such a thing, a standing ovation for the presiding Barbara bishop. I think they're in favor. <laughs> I think, that's I think that was yes. Fair enough. <laughs> and will you uphold Barbara as bishop? We This is a participatory service, Hubert and Mary. We, we, people are not here watching an event. They are participating in it. It's a running dialogue with God being the audience, we hope and pray. The scripture tells us that our Savior Christ spent the whole night in prayer before he chose and sent forth his 12 apostles. Likewise, the apostles prayed before they appointed Matthias to be one of their number. Let us therefore follow their examples and offer our prayers to Almighty God before we ordain Barbara for the work to which the Holy Spirit has called her. We now enter into the litany, or the beginning of the litany, a series of prayers from which there will be responses from the congregation. Will be sung prayers, you mean? These will be sung prayers. Spirit. 
that ye may be sustained and encouraged to persevere to the end, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For her family, that they may be adorned with all Christian virtues, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We are listening to the Litmus, the Reverend Ann Holmes Redding from the Church of the Holy Apostles in New York. At this time, a number of prayers are being prayed by the litmus and the response given by the congregation for not only the church and the diocese of Massachusetts and our particular country, but for the church and oppressed peoples throughout the world. Clearly, these prayers were directed toward the disenfranchised, the lonely, the forgotten. And it's important to the bishop-elect that these people be lifted up in this service as well. So this is hand-tailored for her, so to speak. The litany is part of all ordinations, but she has a choice in the lessons as well as certain prayers and, of course, in choosing her preacher. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our For those in positions of public trust, especially George, our president, and Michael, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our For a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger. That they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the forgiveness of our sins and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Absalom Jones, and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, o Lord, our God. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We now proceed to the readings and the liturgy, uh, the ministry of the word, and there will be a series of readers, and uh, as they come up, we will introduce them to you. The first is the reading from the book of Isaiah, a reading chapter from the 6, book and of Isaiah. it's being read by Dorothy Cousins, St. Luke's Church, Isaiah Germantown, Pennsylvania. Chapter verses 1 through 8. The spirit of the Lord Yahweh has been given to me, for Yahweh has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up hearts that are broken, to proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to those in prison, to proclaim a year of favor from Yahweh, a day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all those who mourn, and to give them for ashes a garland, for mourning robe, 
the oil of gladness. For despondency, praise. They are to be called tenebrates of integrity, planted by Yahweh to glorify him. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise what has long lain waste. They will restore the ruined cities, all that has lain waste for ages past. Strangers will be there to feed your flocks, foreigners as your plowmen and vine dressers. But you, you will be named priest of Yahweh. They will call you ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and array yourselves in their magnificence. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. For those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. For those whose sins you retain, they are retained. That was the Reverend Zanetta Armstrong from Mattapan Church of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel Cuando will now be read in Spanish. De aquel mismo día, el primero de la semana, estando las puertas cerradas en el lugar donde los discípulos estaban reunidos por miedo de los judíos, vino Jesús y puesto en medio les dijo, paz a vosotros. Y cuando les hubo dicho esto, les mostró las manos y el costado, y los discípulos se regocijaron viendo al Señor. Entonces Jesús les dijo otra vez, paz a vosotros. Como me envió el Padre, así también yo os envío. Y habiendo dicho esto, sopló y les dijo, recibid el Espíritu Santo. A quienes remitiereis los pecados, les serán remitidos. Y a quienes se los retuviereis, les serán retenidos. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. There are a number of Spanish-speaking members of the Episcopal Church in this diocese, so it's not just an act of appealing to those beyond the borders, but the Spanish-speaking congregation who's here. Now we're having come to the pulpit, the preacher for the day, selected by the suffragan bishop-elect, the Reverend Paul Matthews Washington of Philadelphia, her mentor and good friend. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is yet another beauty, beautiful, glorious day which the Lord has made. May we rejoice for this day and may we be glad in this day. We have already, however, been made aware of a painful fact that there are some who are not happy about that which is happening now and it is their sincere belief that this is contrary to the will of God. They are still in this church and God's mystical body here on this earth is not yet wholly one. But may we continue to pray that one day will come when if not because of ourselves, because of Jesus Christ our Savior, we will experience that oneness. Although for us, finite creatures of time, this day reveals an event never before beheld by the eyes of humankind. That 
which is happening for us today was inherent in eternity. Long ago, when God said, let there be light, the light which we see at this moment began its journey before the beginning of time. That light moved at the speed of light, at times challenged by the awful gravity of those black holes from which not even light could escape. But their darkness could not comprehend that light. And today we behold its glory, its beauty, its warmth, and the new life which it holds as a light of the world. On Saturday afternoon, September 24th, I received a call from a friend, one who is very, very dear to me. She said, Paul, guess what? I said, what? <laughs> I just got a call from David Johnson, the Bishop of Massachusetts. He said that I've been elected to be a suffragan bishop. I softly exclaimed, what? <laughs> I can't believe it. She continued, I can't believe it either. <laughs> How could I have been elected to be a bishop in this church? That news to her was as incredulous as the news was to another woman some 2,000 years ago <laughs> when she asked, How can this be, seeing I know not a man? <laughs> See that, Tom Logan? <laughs> Most or many of us have been caught up in experiences of life which are absolutely incomprehensible. I remember some 10 or 12 years ago when Philadelphia had one of the worst snowstorms in decades. I looked outside and I saw that snow and I said to myself, boy, if I could get into my office this morning, there will be no telephones, there will be no intrusions. I can attack all of that chaos on my desk and I can get some work done. I don't know why such a crazy notion came to my mind. <laughs> but I had my breakfast and after breakfast, I still felt a kind of compulsion. And so I adorned myself in layers of clothing, put on my boots, a warm hat, and I got a shovel. The door of the rectory is about 60 feet from my office door. And so I got my shovel and I started shoveling. I progressed one foot a minute and finally I got into the door I said oh boy this is going to be a great day I can work 
no intrusions, no interruptions, and I tackled the paper. And then I heard a sound. It, it so happens that there's some dead people buried <laughs> under the Church of the Advocate. <laughs> so I thought maybe the dead were stirring. <laughs> but then I heard the sound again. It was a knock at the door. I went to the door and there stood a man and a woman. I was incredulous. I began to ask, how did you get here? Where did you come from? How far did you come? Why did you come? <laughs> they answered the last question first. They said, we don't have any food in the house. We didn't have any supper last night. And we have four children. And we were all hungry. And so we came to get some food. But then I, I just had to ask another question. I said, did you really expect me to be here today? He said, when we woke up this morning, something told me and my husband, go to the advocate. And so we just came. And so they warmed themselves. I gave them plenty of food. They thanked me, they thanked God, and they left. But after they left, I still had one more question. Paul Washington, why did you feel that you had to go to your office this morning? And I came up with the same answer that I had heard only minutes before. It's God. It's God. He drove me to my office. And he had set up an appointment for me to feed his sheep. I just wish the next time God sets up an appointment for me, <laughs> he will let me know <laughs> in advance. But Paul, can you tell me how I could have been elected to be a bishop? And I could only say, Barbara, it was God. It was God. He plants his footsteps in the sea. And he rides upon the storm. That's God. He caused Merrick to conceive. She knew not a man. He led the children of Israel out of bondage across the Red Sea. He called Ambrose to be a bishop. Ambrose wasn't a priest. He wasn't a deacon. He wasn't confirmed. He wasn't even baptized. He called Harriet Tubman. Who would believe that that frail, sickly woman, just about Barbara's si size, <laughs> who would believe that she would walk away from bondage saying that before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. She left slavery behind. But she remembered those whom she left behind. And 19 times 
she went back into the land of bondage. And she didn't rest until she had brought out over 300 of her sisters and brothers. God had freed her, and therefore she showed her thanksgiving to God by freeing others. God sent this husband and this wife through a snowstorm of decades to meet a pastor who would be waiting with food for a hungry family. How could you have been elected to be a bishop? It is well that we ask this question because first of all you're not a white male. <laughs> you're not a male of African descent and you're not a white woman. Nor do you have the academic credentials which are badges of worthiness. You haven't even been a priest for ten years. You whose progenitors were only three-fifths human with no rights that a white man had to honor. This is the church which consecrated bishops Denby and Delaney as bishops for colored people. But at some time way back there, that voice was heard once again, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And this diocese, Massachusetts, led the way when it elected John Bridges to be a supplement. Not for colored people, but for the people of God. John Bridges then became a diocesan. Who would have thought that that could happen? And comes Johnny come lately. <laughs> Johnny Walker, a suffragist, coadjutor, and one after one, we saw the path being made straight and the rough places being made plain. And we saw the glory of God being revealed. Then that awful day, July 29th, 1974, 11 women were ordained on July the 29th. They were untimely ripped from their mother's womb. It shook this church to its very foundation. Earthquake, fire and flood. The House of Bishops even said there were no ordinations. I guess that was at that meeting at the airport. But as God saw fit to make women priests in his church, 11 of them. Barbara, you were in California that morning. You jumped on a plane came to your church, the Church of the Advocate in North Philadelphia, and you led the procession. You didn't know when you led that procession that God was preparing you to lead another procession. <laughs> we cannot and we must not overlook the fact 
that this woman who is being consecrated today is not just an American woman. She is a black woman, called at one time a Negro, called at one time colored. Stony the road you've trod, bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to this place for which our fathers sighed. We are to know, however, that while our church will have consecrated 17 persons of African descent ascent descent to the office of a bishop, including one woman, 17, but to this date only seven black priests have ever been elected to be priests or rectors in white congregations. So I would say as of today that the camel has gotten through the eye of the needle. I have purposely, purposely, and ever so briefly recounted 400 years of history and of racism in America as well as in our church because it is only in understanding the past that we can appreciate fully God's action in this event in the midst of which we find ourselves. I can't let us be people who come to church on Easter who have not gone through a Lent. I can't allow us to come to church on Easter and not know anything about Gethsemane and Good Friday. There were some Good Fridays before this Easter which we are now celebrating. We have all come over a way that with tears have been watered, doing it again. <coughs> We've all come over a way that with tears have been watered, shorting our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Doesn't it tell you that God's truth is marching on? God's truth is marching on. Thank you. In this continued drama of the Incarnation, the Eternal Word speaks. As he spoke in the beginning, he speaks today. He shall speak forever hereafter. O oh, my church, O oh, my Episcopal church, people talk about you. In fact, somebody wrote about you in a book, The Power of Their Glory, America's Ruling Class, the Episcopalians, the Church of Presidents of this nation, including the present President. Your members have power connections. It is the church of families which run things with extraordinary influence. A church of senators, chief executives in many of the nation's largest corporations, of bank presidents and prestigious lawyers, 
But today I have chosen a have not. I have chosen one who in this land has been humiliated. I've chosen one of the humblest. I've chosen one of the most impotent in our world. I've chosen such a one to be exalted. Today I send you one who has spent enough time in prisons ministering to prisoners and captives to have almost served a two-year sentence yourself, oh, my church. Today I'm sending one to you who's from a church that feeds hungry people two to three hundred a day. I'm sending you to a church that provides clothes for naked people a church that is about to build 25 units of housing for the homeless. I'm sending one to you who went down to Mississippi to lift up those who were participating in their own oppression, to lift them up to participate in their own liberation. Oh, my church, I'm sending one to you today who does not have the credentials of the world, the BAs, the THMs, the THDs, but one who can only say, just I as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's all she can say, but that's a mouthful. If you know that God's blood has been shed for you, then you are somebody. But if you don't know it, you're nobody. Today I'm sending one to you today who burns when others are offended. She's a disturbing prophet who has said with her life, with her life, let justice run down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream yesterday. Is the scripture being fulfilled before your eyes? Today God has chosen this foolish thing to confound the wise. God has chosen this weak thing of the world to confound the mighty. He has chosen one who's been at the base of our society, despised. He has chosen one who in this society is considered to be a nobody, to bring to naught some of the things that are. She cannot glory in her flesh. She can only say, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit rejoices and God my savior. He has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. And history will bear a record that he chose even me to be the first woman to be a bishop, not just in the 450 years of the Anglican Church, but in the history of the Catholic Church. She can only say, he that is mighty hath magnified me. I'm not big enough. I don't possess the credentials to magnify myself. Holy and wonderful his name is his name. And his mercy is on those who will fear him throughout all generations. And may I love him and may I serve him, and may I fear him all the days of my life. She went as far as Mary up to that point. But Mary got beside herself. 
Mary got carried away. God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seat and exalted the humble and meek. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. You see, Mary was an oppressed woman. And this is how oppressed people feel. That's how Holy Mary, Mother of God, that's how she felt. Then she went on to say, He, remembering his mercy, hath helped his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham, and to seed forever. Today we must recognize that God's message to us is the medium. The medium is the message. The messenger herself may never know and certainly never comprehend all that God is saying as he's choosing her to be another incarnation of his word. But I see not only a message to the whole church, but I see a message to the black church in this Episcopal church. I know that we are a people who from our lay people up through bishops are oh, we are pretty proud to be Episcopalians. We are priests. We are people who believe in the sacraments. Many of our people are Du Bois's talented tenth, teachers and principals and professors and lawyers, doctors, degreed. Our people have positions of prestige. Our people have culture, all of whom Jesus died to save. And thank God for your ministry to these precious children of God but I'm thinking of the haunts of wretchedness and need in the ghettos of our cities. I'm thinking of the thresholds dark with fears, of the paths where the lures of greed are hidden. I'm thinking of communities drunk with drugs, where this mother and father traveled seven blocks to find food, because there was no food in the house. I'm thinking that some of us are rather far removed from these to even catch a vision of their tears. The medium today is the message, for it is from such a church and I sent her there 20 years ago for a reason. I sent her in the midst of haunts of prejudice and need so that when she became a bishop, you would know where she came from. The medium is the message. Harriet Tubman did not forget from when she came. She might have had to adopt Mr. Tubman's name and work in Mr. Tubman's field, but Mr. Tubman had problems. She relieved him of his problems. <laughs> and you must help to continue to redeem and reconcile all of God's children to God and to, other, and to each other. But I ask all of you, what did you come into the wilderness to see? What did you come into this wilderness to see? Did you come to see the first woman consecrated as a bishop in the Episcopal Church. If that's all you came here for, you have missed the point. 
This isn't just a woman, but this is a woman who is born in slavery. This is a woman who's had to struggle. She's been despised. She's been rejected. She's been kicked in her teeth. She has been counted in our society as nothing. And when she entered the Americas, there was a sign over a gate saying, abandon all hope, all you who enter herein. And so today, you didn't just come here to see a woman who is being consecrated. You have come to see God, who with his mighty hand has lifted up one who was at the bottom of our society and who has exalted her to sit in a chair to be one of his chief pastors. The word of God is once again being made flesh in our midst. Once again, I am coming to you. Know me this time. And so, Barbara, first, let me address this moment, this awful moment, which has magnified your uniqueness even to frightening proportions. A time might come when, like Jeremiah, you might have asked, Miss B, why did you give birth to me? time might come when you might ask why was I expulsed from my mother's womb to see labor and sorrow and you don't tell me everything but I know you've had some fearful moments since that day but then God again responds be not afraid I am with you to deliver you. You didn't get here by yourself. You are here because I chose you before you were conceived in your mother's womb. I knew you and I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a bishop a long time ago. But you cried again, but Lord, I'm a woman. How can I sit in that awesome, that awful house of bishops? <laughs> and God said, don't tell me you're a woman. I made you to be a woman. You shall go to all that I shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. And I shall be with you always even unto the ends of the world. You heard Audrey Bronson preach at the Advocate after you had been elected and she reminded you that the power behind you is greater than the task which is ahead of you. Don't forget that. The power behind you is greater than the task which is ahead of you. This day was destined to be before you were born. And yet, I know that somehow or another, people are going to say, when they see you, she's a drum major. There goes the drum major. But if you have to feel like a drum major, then remember the words of Martin Luther King. If they say that I'm a drum major, just say that I was a drum major for peace. Just say that I was a drum major for righteousness. 
just say that I was a drum major for justice. Then you won't have. You will have nothing to worry about. All of these other things will seem insignificant. You have spent most of your working years in the business and corporate world. It is a Darwinian world of the survival of the fittest. You survived. You had to have been fit. But you're not fighting to win a personal battle anymore. Right now it is to allow the light of Christ to shine within you that your life may be a glory to God for all people to see. And so a prayer can be always, breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. So don't worry about all these other things. Just keep your hands in the hands of God. And if you do, you ain't gonna have nothing to worry about. Thirdly, I think of a collect in the Book of Common Prayer. Grant that we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not sight of the things eternal. <laughs> Being creatures of flesh and blood in this world, our first actions and reactions are usually always in response to the temporal. They are omnipresent. They are oppressive. And it is as natural as instinct for us to respond in kind and in character to outside stimuli, regardless of what it is. And so doing, however, we may not give ourselves sufficient time to pass beyond the temporal demand to the divine imperative. So don't let the world, don't let anyone set your clock or set your agenda. You're marching to the beat of a distant drummer. His beat will let you know when to rest, when to refresh yourself, when to collect yourself. His beat will tell you when it's time to go again. And if you wait on that beat, you'll always be on time and on target. All right. <laughs> this is the bishop elect's mentor, close friend, and colleague, the preacher, the Reverend Paul Washington of Philadelphia. And that officially was the charge. Uh, the charge from the preacher that says, now you're going out and being a bishop, remember where you came from, and take that out into the world. Uh, a very powerful point throughout the uh, sermon about her Afro-American background, her background in the poor parts of the city, and that she brings that to a job uh, which now has uh, a number of tasks ahead of her. He uh, compared her to Ambrose of Milan. Who, who is that, Tim? 
I thought you weren't going to ask me any church history questions, Barry. <laughs> His tradition is such that uh, the church at one time saw such a gift in a man that they just took him without going through any sort of orders and made him one of their own. So that was an to answer lead. to those who criticize her credentials as not being good enough. It's been one of the uh, great issues of this uh, entire process. St. Paul's AME Church is, uh, choir is going to sing an anthem called Close to Thee um, at this point. It was a wonderful sermon. Uh, he hit upon many of the important themes of the uh, consecration. Again, the broadening of the Episcopal Church is what I think is occurring. The Afro-American tradition and its style of worship is getting much, uh, a lot of play here, and the style of preaching that he presented really indicated that.
as the Protestant Episcopal Church you're watching today with that moving gospel tune following the sermon as Barbara now prepares to be examined. This Probably is very rarely have we seen a bishop clap and dance to music <laughs> during her own ordination. A very moving. First. If you're just joining us, we're broadcasting live from the Heinz Auditorium the ordination of Bishop Barbara Harris. We are about to begin the examination by her fellow bishops. For the purpose of it. My sister, the people have chosen you and have affirmed their trust in you by acclaiming your election. A bishop in God's holy church is called to be one with the apostles in proclaiming Christ's resurrection and interpreting the gospel and to testify to Christ's sovereignty as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Your call to guard the faith, unity, and discipline of the church, to celebrate and to provide for the administration of the sacraments of the new covenant, to ordain priests and deacons, and to join in ordaining bishops and to be in all things a faithful pastor and wholesome example for the entire flock of Christ. With your fellow bishops, you will share in the leadership of the church throughout the world. Your heritage is the faith of patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and those of every generation who have looked to God in hope. And your joy will be to follow him who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Are you persuaded that God has called you to the office of bishop? I am so persuaded. to this call and fulfill this trust in obedience to Christ. I will obey Christ and will serve in his name. Will you be faithful in prayer and in the study of Holy Scripture that you may have the mind of Christ? I will for he is my help. Will you boldly proclaim and interpret the gospel of Christ? enlightening the minds and stirring up the conscience of your people? I will in the power of the Spirit. As a chief priest and pastor, will you encourage and support all baptized people in their gifts and ministries, nourish them with the riches of God's grace, pray for them without ceasing, and celebrate with them the sacraments of our redemption? I will, in the name of Christ, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Will you guard the faith, unity, and discipline of the church? I will, for the love of God. Will you share with your fellow bishops in the government of the whole church? Will you sustain your fellow presbyters and take counsel with them? Will you guide and strengthen the deacons and all others who minister in the church? I will by the grace given me. Will you be merciful to all, show compassion to the poor and strangers, and defend those who have no helper? I will for the sake of Christ Jesus. <coughs> Barbara, through these promises, you've committed yourself to God to serve his church in the office of bishop. We therefore call upon you, chosen to be a guardian of the church's faith, to lead us in the confessing of that faith. We believe in one God. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things 
Jews are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This is the moment of consecration where nearly 60 bishops have gathered around Bishop-elect Barbara Harris to empower her with the God Holy Spirit. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, dwelling on high but having regard for the lowly, knowing all things before they come to pass. We give you thanks that from the beginning you have gathered and prepared a people to be heirs of the covenant of Abraham and have raised up prophets, kings, and priests, never leaving your temple untended. We praise you also that from the creation you have graciously accepted the ministries of those whom you have chosen. Now all the bishops lay their hands upon her. Therefore, Father, make Barbara a bishop in your church, pour out upon her the power of your Holy Spirit, whom you have bestowed upon your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, with whom he endowed the apostles, and by whom your church is built up in every place, to the glory and unceasing praise of your name. To you, O oh Father, all hearts are open. Fill, we pray, the heart of this your servant, whom you have chosen to be a bishop in your church, with such love of you and of all the people, 
that she may feed and tend the flock of Christ and exercise without reproach the high priesthood to which you have called her, serving before you day and night in the ministry of reconciliation, declaring pardon in your name, offering the holy gifts, and wisely overseeing the life and work of the church. In all things, may she present before you the acceptable offering of a pure and gentle and holy life through Jesus Christ, your Son, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and power and glory in the church now and forever. Amen. She is now a bishop. She is now a bishop. That is probably the largest gathering of bishops ever to participate in the consecration service. Those uh, 